We are, in short, in desperate need of strong global norms and institutions to guide us successfully through this new century. A fresh leadership on a scale that reordered the world after World War II. Mr. President, you have spoken to all of these issues. And because of your important office, we have listened intently with admiration at your fearless outspokenness. And we will do so again today. Thank you for allowing Columbia to share in your present visit to the United States. And when you dine tomorrow evening alone with President Obama, would you please extend to him our very best regards from his alma mater, <laughs> President Sarkozy. I'm going to attempt to be up to the challenge of your prestigious university. And the first rule, the very first rule, is not to read a speech. Because speeches kill off creativity. If one comes simply to read a speech, well, one might as well send the speech ahead of time and save time and uh, carbon on the travel. Now, I'm going to speak from the heart, as a friend, which doesn't mean that we'll agree on everything, I say. And through you, I am addressing the great people of the United States so that you should understand that Europe and the United States of America must, must work together. You belong to a country that is the world's number one power with the strongest currency, the strongest economy, and the largest army. And you have to think about this very carefully. Because what does that mean to be the world's number one power? The world's number one power, leading power, must precisely be that, a leader. But the world's number one power must also consider that because it is powerful, that it must share, it must listen, it must discuss, it must exchange ideas and views with others. If Europe and the United States of America do not redesign this new model, then no one else will do it in lieu of us. That is something you really have to understand. Alone, a Europe will not be able to impose its ideas. Standing alone, the United States of America will not be able to do so either. But if we together do not come up with new, fresh ideas, then no one else will do it instead of us. And that is the reason why I'm here, that I have come to the States. And that is the reason that has governed all my political choices since I was elected President of the French Republic. When we were hit by the economic crisis and that the American administration simply walked away from Lehman Brothers, what you have to realize is that the knock-on effect was not only felt in the United States, but the knock-on effect was disastrous elsewhere in the world, everywhere else in the world. Now, to say this is not to make, it's not to criticize, it's not to be reproachful, it is simply to call a spade a spade. The world is totally, fully interdependent and interlocked. What you succeed in doing here will be a success for the rest of the world. What you fail to do here will be a failure for the rest of the world. The dollar is no longer the world's single currency. It is a very important currency, but it is not the only currency. The yuan, the Chinese currency, 
is an important currency. Part of your savings is in Chinese hands. So we have to come up with, we have to design a new international monetary order and decide together on how to handle and manage interest rates and how to regulate uh, currency fluctuations. I mean, how can we still operate on the basis of Bretton Woods as designed 60 years ago, or is it not in our interest to stop and think about a new international, world international uh, monetary order? That is a fascinating discussion, which I will push forward when we're in the presidency of the G20 and something which I will be talking about with President Obama. You see, new world governance, a new international monetary system, a new system to regulate commodity prices, and a means, a new ways of regulating the market economy and free trade, that is what matters. That is going to shape the world in which you are going to be living. Economic, world economic regulation can no longer stand still. It can't stay where it is. We can no longer accept a capitalist system where there are no rules, no organization, no structure, no regulation. Now, I know that when a Frenchman comes here, he's always a suspect in some way. Isn't he really talking about protectionism, perhaps? Isn't he a bit of a socialist? Is he liberal enough? Is he free trade enough? Well, let me say one thing. By calling for the regulation of capitalism, what I am doing is laying the foundations of that which will save capitalism, the market economy, and unbridled capitalism is tantamount to the death of capitalism because one day people will no longer accept what occurred. We are here in New York. New York, a town, a martyr city. In 9-11, 2001, no one has forgotten that in the fight against terrorism. We all of us need to put our weight. You need us and we need you. When I woke up this morning, I heard that our Russian friends, because they are our friends, have been hit by two attacks in the Moscow subway. There's more than 30 dead, uh, two kamikaze women who blew themselves up on the subway. Do you think there's any difference between the mad people who were killing innocents in the Moscow subway and the crazed individuals who hit the Twin Towers here in New York? I mean, do we make a difference? Do we start picking and choosing and have a kind of ranking of terrorism? No, of course not. When New York was attacked, it was the world's democracies who are under attack. And when Moscow is attacked, it is all of us who are attacked. When faced with terrorism and terrorism, terrorists, we cannot stand divided. Sometimes seen from the European perspective, when we look at the American debates on reforming health care, it's difficult to believe. We rub our eyes in disbelief. The idea, I mean, the, the very fact that it should have given rise to such violent debate, that si simply on the fact that the poorest of American society should not be left out in the streets without a cent to look after them from the healthcare point of view is something astonishing to us. I mean, we sorted the problem out 50 years ago. Of course, it's difficulty. Of course, it's uh, it's expensive because healthcare is expensive. But you can't let people simply die. The government can't simply turn its back on those who don't have the means to go to hospital. Well, I don't want to get too involved. But honestly, if you come to France, and something happened to you, I don't know, on the sidewalk, we're not going to be, you won't be asked for your credit card before you're rushed to hospital. Welcome to the club of states who don't turn their backs on the sick and the poor. When you chose President Obama, 
The entire world was proud of you. The entire world placed it, its hopes in you. And I should say that the debate between President Obama and Senator McCain, I felt, was a triumph of American democracy. And sometimes when I speak to President Obama, and I have great pleasure in talking with him, discussing things with him, sometimes says to me, you know, on certain issues such as the environmental regulation, I'm a little ahead of what a lot of Americans believe. And I say to him, don't lag, and I say to you rather, don't lag behind your president when it comes to regulation, when it comes to defending the environment, when it comes to listening to others. Because in this world of ours, the world of the 21st century, we cannot afford to have the world's number one power not being open to the rest of the world. The world does not stop at the East Coast nor at the West Coast. So there, please take this message from a French president who is your true friend, who admires you and who loves the United States of America. Thank you.